All right. Welcome everybody to Cities Lead, an embodied carbon policy framework. The learning objectives for this session are shown here and we'll be following up with a survey and with more information on how to receive AIA credit post events. We'll also collect questions submitted during the Q&A, um, sorry, through the Q&A box during this session. And if the speakers aren't able to get to all of your questions before the end of the session, we'll have them answer the questions in writing and we will share all of those answers on the website after the teaching. So feel free to ask any questions you want. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker for this session. Here we go. Johanna Parton is the founder and director of the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, a collaboration of global cities committed to achieving carbon neutrality well before 2050, the most aggressive greenhouse gas reduction targets undertaken by any cities anywhere. Previously, Johanna served as North America Regional Director for the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group and Senior Policy Advisor on Environment to San Francisco Mayors Gavin Newsom and Edwin Lee. Johanna has 30 years experience in the field of climate change, renewable energy, microfinance, sustainable development, and gender equity. Take it away, Johanna. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my screen. We absolutely And can. hopefully this will work. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. And um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with C40 and Architecture 2030, with whom we worked on what I'll be talking about today. Um, so first, just a, a quick background on uh, the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. We are a collaboration of leading cities around the world that are working to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions well before 2050, which is the uh, most ambitious climate targets of any city in the world. And you can see a little map of, of our members there. Um, and so the way that we do that is um, because our cities are really leading in this space, um, you know, they really are kind of setting the agenda for what ambitious urban climate action looks like. Um, they serve as an innovation lab for urban carbon neutrality solutions and a catalyst for uh, our big focus is really around transformational change and systemic urban change. And we're very much focused on implementing implementation and action. So just a little background on on who we are. Um, so as we've been talking about as part of this uh, conference, you know, um, there's been a big focus, especially in cities on implementing policies and incentives for reducing operational carbon uh, and operational energy in buildings especially. But as has been discussed, embodied carbon will really be responsible for half of global emissions um, in the building space in new construction between now and 2050. And so embodied carbon is really a substantial source of carbon emissions uh, in cities, and it's something that can be dramatically reduced through legal and regulatory powers, powers that cities hold. We didn't realize this at cities, in cities, for many years. Um, and up until about a year ago, there were only two cities in the world that had enacted policies to reduce embodied carbon. And in the broader sense, um, in the carbon in the embodied carbon space the focus in general has been on industry and supply side and less on the policy side but as we know policies not only shape what is happening in cities but it also shapes the business environment that influences the entire construction trade so um, some leading cities around the world have already begun to adopt and apply these policies but for these climate goals to be for our broader climate goals to be met uh, global implementation rapidly needs to be accelerated. So that's why in partnership with BioNova and Architecture 2030 and a group of leading global cities around the world, um, earlier this year, over the past year, and we launched it earlier this year, we created the Embodied Carbon Policy Framework for cities. Um, as I said, we launched this in June this year, and the framework provides guidance for cities that are considering policies that can deliver the highest impact within their geopolitical context and regulatory systems. 
And um, you can see some of the folks that helped to support this work. It was made possible through the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Construction Climate Challenge hosted by Volvo, the Finnish Ministry of Environment, the National Research Council on Canada, and then the cities of Helsinki, Oslo, and Tampere. So um, the policy framework examines 52 policies from leading cities and evaluated those policies and then ranked and categorized them uh, according to their embodied carbon reduction potential, their cost efficiency, their ease of implementation, and their enforceability. And in addition to the, pro the framework document, which is available online, and I'll, I'll provide the, um, the link, we're also hosting a series of how-to webinars for cities that are interested in implementing any of these policies. We've held two of them so far on zoning and land use and building, and, uh, regu building regulations. And then we've got one coming up in September on procurement and public projects and another in October on waste circularity and financial aspects. And again, those are open to the public. They're targeted to cities, but anybody is available to participate in those. And I'll provide that link so that you can sign up for those if you'd like. And then finally, we've created a help desk for cities that could use a little bit of extra handholding and technical support as they consider which policies might be appropriate for them to adopt in their own context. As I mentioned, all of the policies in the report are evaluated according to carbon impact, uh, cost efficiency, et cetera. And we, in the report, we provide real life examples of each policy if it has already been implemented by a city. And in some cases where it hasn't been implemented at a city, but it's been implemented either at a county or a state, or in some cases, a national level, we provide those examples. We used a prioritization tool that we called the Embodied Carbon Pyramid um, to consider the project stage, the actions, and the impacts of each of the policies. So, policies, the types of policies that we looked at, redefine the solution, policies for re refurbishing uh, existing assets, policies for reducing and replacing materials and structures, reusing products and materials, and policies for requiring low carbon products. Uh, some of the policy impacts are also visualized and the colors on this screen are the type of policy according to the, the pyramid that I showed on the previous slide and the size of the bubble represents the embodied carbon reduction potential. And if you go to the website, um, interactive charts are also available and that website is www.embodiedcarbonpolicies.com. And so you can see here, this is what the uh, interactive policy uh, map looks like on the website. And again, embodiedcarbonpolicies.com. Sorry that the, uh, it looks like the website there got cut off, but um, embodiedcarbonpolicies.com is where you can find this. And with that, I will, uh, Aaron, turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Johanna. All right, we are going to do this again and let Cecile present. Cecile Farood leads the Clean Construction Program at C40, the network of the world's mega cities committed to addressing climate change. Through her work, Cecile supports market dialogues and collaborates with key global and national stakeholders representing the private sector and advocates for a whole life and circular approach to our built environment. Prior to C40, Cecile managed the development of the London City Business Leaders Initiative aimed at aligning the climate ambitions and actions of the capital and its businesses. She also shaped and led the circular economy program for the city of Petersburg in the UK authored blogs on the circular economy and led on French and Southeast Asian collaboration for sustainable development and cross-cutting regional issues when based at the French embassy in Bangkok. There you go. All right, you are ready to go. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and you can actually already, already go to the second slide. Uh, thank you. And it's, um, it's great to, to be in this session, as Joanna is saying, we're doing um, great collaborative work, all three organizations together and with the city that we're working in. And it's really important to share what we're doing and, and to make 
really people understand how cities lead on this topic. So a bit of, um, of background on C40, um, it's basically a global network of cities um, taking global and bold action on climate change. We have 96 cities, over 70, uh, 700 million people represented in these cities and over 25% of the world's economy. Um, and if you wonder why that is important and that the next slide, it's because first we are in a climate emergency um, and, and the kids demonstrating, even though uh, their protest is a bit, uh, are a bit hidden now in a lockdown mode, but they're still protesting. Um, and if they are protesting on this climate emergency and if cities need to act on it, it's because, next slide, all governments are not taking sufficient action on it. And we cannot wait for them to basically take uh, their responsibility and therefore, we really need to rely on mayors who are really realizing um, that they need to act on this. And the reason why they, they, uh, mayors are really willing to act on climate change, and especially on, on topics um, such as embodied emission, it's because they are at the forefront of the effect of the negative impacts of the climate crisis on, on their cities, which is the next slide, please. Um, basically, in a world where we already have one degree of overeating, C40 cities are experiencing um, really what we call a new climate reality. And I won't expand on that, um, but we are all aware of the California wild, wildfires at the moment, which are, are unprecedented. We had exceptional floods in Lima um, in 2017. Cape Town reached the water zero ground almost uh, last year. So all of our cities are really experiencing dramatic realities, which means that we need to tackle the emissions where they happen most. Um, and that's one of the area where construction is definitely involved. And that's the next slide. And I won't teach anyone anything on this because if you are on, on this, um, on this event is because you're very well aware of the impact of construction, but just to put it at, once again, um, at scale between cities, construction and the climate crisis, um, it's because construction do happen in city at rates that means that it will only intensify in the coming years and decades. Um, and construction contribute to a large chunk um, of global GHG emission they also contribute to global resource consumption um, and the design and the material choice that we're making today are basically looking in emissions for decades, but they also have a very immediate impact on cities' resilience. And to take only one, um, one example on, on concrete, uh, that really can contribute um, if a full neighborhood is made in concrete with no greeneries, no water, um, it really contributes to the urban heat island effect and can be very detrimental to the health of communities um, when it waves its, and especially in the US, community of colors are the first impacted. Um, and in a COVID world that we are living in right now, um, construction is usually the way, construction of buildings and infrastructure is usually the way that governments wants to put back the economy to its feet. Um, so we really need to be careful of not building for the sake of building, um, but using the right way of building clean construction methods, which is very much why uh, C40 has set up a network, um, a, a forum basically, which consists of a network of cities sharing um, their knowledge, inspiring each other to take action and really having the mayors mandate their team to work on such a new topic for them, which is the next slide, Erin, uh, please. Um, but also really offer a platform for these cities to really work with the private sector because cities cannot do it alone. Um, cities definitely need to work with the private sector to get the change um, happening and, and to work on this. So, what are exactly the challenges, which is the next slide, please, that, that cities are faced with in terms of embodied emission? 
um, basically because it's a global sector that is very much fragmented, um, which, which has a complex supply chain and, and chain of responsibilities. When we look at addressing the origin and the impact of materials, cities do not have usually um, an, an enough share basically of the construction market to be able to leveraging it. Um, so they need to aggregate their demand and work together to really send a strong signal to the industry that they're ready to go there. Then the reuse of materials is often um, hindered or um, cannot really happen because of legal and insurance issues around safety and, and risks. Um, cities are very much confronted with the fact that it's a new topic and data are not there in a global harmonized system. Um, so there is a number of platforms, tools, certification and standards that they can look towards. And they don't even not only know um, which one to pick and which one is the most available, the, the, the most um, relevant. But also most um, life cycle assessments and, and EPDs data do not include um, social consideration or ethics beyond the environmental credential, which is the case, for instance, for, for um, certifications such as FSC, which are quite criticized. Um, at the moment yet widely used. There is also a, a cultural issue with the fact that the norm in our Western um, buildings is to over-engineer, so over-poor concrete, overuse steel uh, than the structural needs um, should be. And, and that becomes an aspiration for many parts of the world, which means that we're using way much material that we should in the first place. And then the final type of challenge that cities are faced with is that industrial processes such as steel miling are often located um, when, when they are located within the city boundary, which is not often the case, but when it is the case, it's controlled at national level rather than um, at city level, which means that they really need to work in collaboration with, with the states, federal or um, national government to make any progress on this. So that's not a bleak picture. <laughs> there are ways and a lot of ways in which cities can act, which is the next, next slide. And, and Joanna shared many of them in terms of, of the policies um, and regulation that uh, cities can take. So I would not dwell too much into that, but uh, we were very pleased to, um, to really work with, with CNCA and Architecture 2030 on this, and, and I will come to that later, but on top of the policies and regulation that cities can use, which goes from building codes, land use planning, circular economy, fiscal measure, and, and finance, financial schemes, they can first and foremost uh, set the vision and uh, really articulate strategies and targets that will set the tone for where cities and their stakeholders need to go and work toward. Um, they can also show the way and lead the way um, by example, using their municipal procurement um, and, and using the specification. They can also demand more transparency and accountability by asking for carbon assessment and more life cycle approaches. Um, they can demonstrate the value and really help making the case on these new approaches by developing flag flagship program um, and demonstration project and, and C40 as a competition that is called Reinventing Cities that I would encourage you to, to Google and to look at, which is really looking at how cities can put the best price, environmental, social price to project, rather than the most economically viable one. Um, and most of all, a city can use their soft powers to really convene the community of stakeholders and local actors that need to come together to find join, joined up solution. And to give you a, a glance and, and a sense of what's happening, um, that is the next slide. When CNCA launched um, the policy framework, we joined launch, jointly at the, on the same day, basically a complementary set of resource, which is the Clean Construction Policy Explorer that showcase all of this type of action that I just mentioned that cities are taking 
so from all of the policies categories that are listed in the CNCO report, but also on the strategy targets um, and, and vision that cities are setting, and also on the pilots that they're trialing to, to make the case. And I really invite you to explore um, this, this map. Um, you can filter by region, by cities, by type of policies, by, by strategy of pilots to really get a sense of, of what's happening in cities globally at the moment. And this map is going to be a living map. We, it's going to be translated um, in the coming months and we will add more information. But if you are a city and in the audience, even if you're not C40 city, uh, please do let us know. We're, we're really keen to showcase good work that, that cities are doing in this field. Um, next slide, please. Another thing that city can do and that we're working towards is, is really aggregate their demand and send a strong um, message to the world. And that's the way that uh, C40 declarations usually work. And there is one coming by the end of the year on clean construction that is really aiming to showcase city leadership and, and explain how cities are leading the way um, leading by example, leading by principle. And that means not only looking at, um, at purely emission states, but also looking at how does it impact local communities, um, have an equity aspect uh, really embedded at the core of all of this. And, and really also looking at prioritizing local just green jobs. Um, it's also really aiming at unlocking the benefits of, of clean construction by looking at improving health and well-being for all, um, reducing immediate impacts such as air and noise pollution, really stimulating a local economy, um, especially embedding circular economy principles, strengthening the resilience of the city with the choices that we're making now, and, and overall fostering sustainable lifestyles. But the main thing that we're trying to do with this declaration is also for the mayors to really shift the market and, and send this strong message, which is the second, the last slide on this. And shifting the market will be done by aggregating city demand, but also relating to the um, hierarchy of um, the, the pyramid that Joanna was, was sharing, really prioritizing and valuing the existing building stock that is there first, which is really important um, and really work along this pyramid um, all together, what we call the, the construction hierarchy, um, really requiring transparency and accountability with a phased approach um, and a consultation process and incentivizing the just transition as I was um, mentioning, why um, having the case ready by um, really using the data from pilots that are that they are going to put into place and that are already happening so this is just to give a very quick um overview of what of what we're doing and what city can do we have some examples um both you and i that we can share so happy to answer any question All right, thank you, Cecile. Johanna, would you like to join us back on video? We can start looking at some of the questions. Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna start with the questions, pretty straightforward and I'm hoping the answer is yes, but we'll see. Do any of your cities incentivize currently low embodied carbon new development? Um. I can jump in, Cecile. I know that that is a big part of what's included in the in the map um, that you just talked about. So, incentivizing is what most cities are doing now if they're doing anything around embodied carbon. Um, the regulatory process for um, regulating embodied carbon. There are a few cities that have adopted policies um, around the world, but most of those are not in the regulatory space. They're in the incentivizing space right now. Um, there are at least three or four cities that are, are regulating um, 
uh, Zurich, Oslo, Vancouver are, are three, for example, but most of the other cities that, that we have been working with are incentivizing low embodied carbon new development. Um, and they're doing that through zoning or if they can offer um, specific um, financial incentives or kind of get to the front of the line incentives. Um, and C Cecilia, you can probably talk about that in a little bit more detail. Thanks, Fiona. Um, th there are actually various entry points to, um, to really not only incentivizing, but actually having a, a hard stance and, and making a change on this. Um, so indeed, the policies that are already in place, this, this, there is a 40% reduction target in, in Vancouver, Oslo, and then zero construction emission sites. Um, Zurich, I'm not so familiar with, so you and I feel free to, to, um, to develop more on this one. But there are others that are taking approaches um, on actually looking at either air quality um, with uh, the zero, zero emission zones and how does that link into actually using uh, zero emission machinery, which is the first entry point uh, to then looking at low carbon emissions um, materials. It's usually the first kind of step. Um, London, is developing currently a new London plan, um, which has been, which is under consultation, um, that will include the requirement for wall life carbon assessments and circular economy statement for all submitted um, strategic planning proposals. Paris uh, as um, as a, a target actually in in place um, to have thirty percent of the city new offices building to be reversible, which means adaptable and deconstructible by 2030. Um, and that really tackles new development, but especially, especially, especially office building. Um, and Rotterdam, Amsterdam are basically embedding circular economy into their overall climate change plans and city planning. Um, and that means that they actually have um, aims to reduce the use of primary raw materials by 50% by 2030, which is kind of not so much an incentive that we really much a, a target that will come into, into effect. Great. Um, I have a great follow-up question from the, the same attendee as well. So are there any cities that are currently using, or I, I'll expand it to say, considering using low embodied carbon scoring or other types of incentives really as a way to incentivize needed development like affordable housing, but put the brakes on development that isn't legitimately needed, but is all about the broken growth paradigm which we're discussing. I think that's a great question. Do you wanna? You want me to go first, Joanna? You want to go first? <laughs> um, it's um, it's a very tricky sphere, and I, I would be lying if I was saying that we have already great example to share on this. It's um, it's starting, and the thinking on social housing is very much developing and fast, but I don't think you know cities are yet in a, in a space where they can showcase you know strong. Um, vetted program because it's a new topic for most of them and they've, they've been in this field for a few years for those that are most advanced and just starting really embedding it uh, fully um, for the last year really for most of them. Yeah and the only thing I would add is I'm not aware of any cities that are using embodied carbon policies to advance affordable housing but I am aware of some cities that are trying to tackle both priorities, reducing embodied carbon and advancing affordable housing. And so trying to really prioritize as opposed to maybe downtown zones, um, really looking at other parts of the cities that are desperately in need of affordable housing and trying to pilot test or, or, um, or launch these programs where affordable housing can also advance, reduce embodied carbon. Um, and I, with COVID and so many businesses shutting down, we are seeing examples of cities that are taking 
buildings that are vacant and or have become vacant and trying to find ways that those can be um, converted to affordable housing. And I should also note that the policies um, that most of the cities that um, that are advancing these are not necessarily just for new construction, but they're for large scale retrofits as well. And so you can very much use these same principles in retrofits. And really that's the, the best and highest use of those, of those building spaces anyway. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I, I fully agree that it's, it's very much at the core of cities preoccupation to actually knot it all together. So how we tackle both the climate crisis, the equity crisis, the COVID economic crisis, and how do we find the best solution to tackle three topics um, in one. Great. Um, all right, so changing themes a little bit, can you expand on how Western buildings are over-engineered and how existing market forces, even if only financial, do not disincentivize the inefficient use of materials. It's um, so at the moment, and it's mostly usually for ease of process um, and over safety concerns, but um, there are a number of type of concrete that you can use um, that have different property and structural values. Um, but usually the, the safest option is to go for the strongest one, even though structurally you don't need it. Um, so uh, there is an over specification basically of due to security and, and due to safety, so, sorry, concerns of, um, of materials buildings that do not need to be that strength. Um, and also we're putting more than is needed. So there is more concrete, more steel, more glass, um, more plastics in our building that is actually needed to have great building, efficient, secure building, up, at, up and standing and, and resilient. Um, there, is, there are a number of, um, of studies and reports on this that we can share if that's of interest um, as, as follow-ups. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is, you know, the most inefficient use of materials is to build something and then knock it down and then build with brand new materials. And one of the biggest challenges that we found when we were having this conversation with the cities involved in the policy framework development is that that's the toughest reuse of materials is the toughest piece to tackle in the embodied carbon space because of safety and security issues, as Sil men mentioned. And it's very difficult if a building was designed and built, you know, 50 years ago or even 30 years ago, they didn't necessarily put whatever, you know, tracking processes in place need to go in place. So you really understand when I'm taking out this, this window or this piece of steel or concrete, where did that come from? What materials are inside of it? So that is the biggest challenge, I think. And that's where I think we have the biggest amount of work to do and I think that cities working together to, with industry, this is where I feel like we need the, the, most, um, the most collaboration and, and cooperation because uh, we have to get to a place where we can deconstruct buildings and we're, buildings, we're building buildings for deconstruction um, and, and so we have a lot of work to do there. Um, okay, so this is a, a great question. Both of you work largely with large cities, um, and a lot of the programs that we've been discussing have been through the lens of large cities. So are there programs or, you know, planned programs in place for smaller cities as well? Um, this, this asker particularly is talking about their city of about 90,000, or you know, I'm going to expand a little bit and say how much applicability do you think these large city programs have to medium sized and smaller sized cities across the globe? Uh, I can jump in first. Way. So, you know, I think both C40 and CNCA work with smaller cities as well. Um, there are a lot of large cities in both networks. The policies are not, it, 
they're not size dependent at all. Um, they're more dependent on what your current regulatory context is based on your state, your province, or your, or your country. So that's where I think the bigger uh, delineating factor is, but at least in the policy framework, and I know that many of the examples that are on the C40 map, um, those can be applied to any city, regardless of size. And for a city like Bend, I would encourage you to join the next um, webinar that we are holding, uh, which is around procurement and public projects on September 23rd. And again, you can go to the website and sign up for that and register for that um, at embodiedcarbonpolicies.com. Um, because most of the policies that are regulating embodied carbon typically have been starting in city procurement, and that's what cities have the most control over. Um, and so, and in fact, that's what, what the September 23rd uh, webinar is going to be about. Um, so I would encourage you to participate in that and then, um, you know, figure out which of those policies might be applicable for your, for your city. Not all of them will, and, and many of them will. That's fantastic. Anything to add, Cecile? I, I would just add that actually smaller cities are, are most of the time in a better situation than bigger cities to tackle the issue in the sense that they have a stronger hand on, their, on the local knowledge of what's happening with the stakeholder community that are working in their city. Um, and for instance, using, you know, used to work in Peterborough, which is a 200 thousand inhabitant city which is even a bit bigger than the size of, of what was just mentioned there but when we worked there we were able to really develop a circular city program that really took the the businesses consideration right at the core of this program um, and, and it was easier to go and see the businesses to really talk to them to have a direct relationship and connection with what would make sense um, and, and there was a stronger sense of what is possible locally who are the people that are the vulnerable communities and, and how we tie all of these questions that we were mentioning earlier, like resilience, adaptation, equity, emissions, um, just transition and basically economic recovery, how we put all that together, we, you have a stronger sense of that when, when you actually have um, a smaller city to, to deal with, a bit less complex. But fully agreeing on that, any type of policies and also strategy, setting the vision, setting the target and using your convening power, all of that apply to any size of cities. That's great. Um, so another question, there are a lot of jurisdictions who have laws or regulations of some sort that might preempt some obvious solutions that we could undertake to reduce embodied carbon. The one we think of um, here in the U.S. a lot is material bans. Um, and so do either of you have any advice or are there, you know, is there, are there frameworks or guidelines within your various programs and research on how to overcome some of those seeming barriers that are just seeming to kind of preempt action down one specific path or another? That, that we well, one thing um, is that usually these bans are national bans, right? It's national legislation or, or regional legislation. We have the same in the UK where, where I'm based, um, where, where it is very much, um, you know, they want, there, there was a ban on timber. Um, and, and that means that we need to use consultation processes. One of the ways that city can really wait in on their national government is if they feel that they have a mandate from their um, citizens and, and the uh, you know, base people um, supporting them. Um, and cities do run a number of consultation processes. And this is where you can voice these concerns. And especially as part of the construction industry, who have all of the arguments to answer to that we need to ensure that we use this consultation voice to ensure that we can counteract and counterbalance and offer arguments in this debate and in this field. That would be my, my first recommendation. Yeah, I, 
Uh, I was going to say something very similar. I think, you know, part of the challenge is that building codes are so onerous and it's so difficult to get involved in that consultation process at the national building code level. We were involved a couple of years ago um, in getting together a coalition of US based cities to influence the building code process and there's this arcane weird voting process that you have to go through and you used to have to be an engineer and now you kind of don't and anyway it's it's really complex but i think i think that point is exactly the case i think this is one of those cases where we need to see kind of lighthouses of really ambitious policies popping up at the city level and then that will influence the state and province level and then hopefully that influences the national level there are many examples in Europe where it's taking a different approach. It takes a much more kind of top-down approach. So in you know Sweden, for example, they're developing a code. In Finland, they're working on a code that'll be in place hopefully in three or four years. Um, and but really, ultimately, what's going to have to happen in Europe is at the EU level. So. Um, I, I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it needs to be, cities need to be as, as ambitious as, as they can possibly be. And then we need every other level of government to be equally ambitious. And there has to be a process of exerting collaborative influence from those who are the most ambitious to influencing those other levels of decision makers. And that's really where it can't just be the cities. It has to be cities working with industry, with finance, with NGOs, et cetera. That's that's a, that's a, sorry, no. it just it, it prompted me uh, on 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 a great example, Joanna. Thanks for <laughs> reminding me. But indeed, in France, and yes, I'm French, so <laughs> but uh, Paris has really started, especially in the Olympics, um, working with CLT, so cross limited timber, and really making uh, a strong stance on on looking at low carbon materials of this and biosourced material, and that that's triggered the national government to really say, okay, we need to look at national targets. Like if Paris, if Paris can do it, we can all do it. So there's definitely a, a level of learning from what cities can do to really inspire and provide confidence to, to government, national government to, to be taking um, the same level of ambition. That was a really strong way to end, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, we we have sessions starting right now, so we are going to end this. And thank you again to Cecile and Johanna, and hope to see you all on the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank you. much.